hello, I'm Claudia Carvin and I'm a long-time supporter of the Wayside Chapel in Sydney's King's Cross. Wayside is a vital support centre for the homeless and the vulnerable, but it's also become a Sydney icon that's pushed the boundaries since it began in the 1960s. Under the guidance of visionary Pastor Graham Long, it's grown into a vibrant community. But after 14 years in the job, Graham is stepping aside and the hunt's been on for someone superhuman to replace him. At Wayside, Christmas Day, it's developed into this street party and it is awesome. Hello. You all right? Hello. Happy Christmas. To see street people owning the street is just the most amazing thing. At Sydney's Wayside Chapel, the Prime Minister pitched in preparing meals for the homeless. You have people who have moved into the very gentrified areas of Potts Point and then you've got people who are sleeping rough. It's a great blend. There's nobody who's an outsider. Everybody truly is welcome and they're served with dignity. Graham is finishing next year, so that's his last Christmas. It's going to be so hard when he goes. 18 months or so ago, Graham got ill. At that stage, we put in place a formal succession process. <laughs> I think we're all thinking, how can he ever be replaced? Who are they going to find? If the successor is someone I can believe in, it'll make my last nine months a dream. They're very big shoes to fill, aren't they, Grahams? He's really patient, he listens, he tells appalling jokes. Oh, you will be missed, you know, that don't you? Life is fluid. There's a time and there's a season to come and there's a time to go. I won't say anything rude like, piss off. <laughs> I hope you had a fabulous party. Three cheers for the Wayside Chapel, hit back. Yeah. Hit back. Yeah. As soon as you arrive at the Wayside, it's everyone's the same. We're all on the same footing. The whole point of everything we do is to create community with no us and them. On our ground floor, when you arrive, you're not met by somebody with a clipboard who needs to find out what kind of problem are you. You find yourself in a cafe, just an ordinary cafe. It's so beautiful, it's like a road. <laughs> The culture that Graham has fostered here is that the visitors feel like they are not problems to be fixed, they are people to be met. And that is palpable. Most hobbies you got cost, cost a lot of money and it costs you money every time you go and do it. That's right. Graham really loves people. He loves the unlovely, the ones that you could walk past in the street. If they were a homeless person, they are able to have a shower. Good morning, how are you today? Can I grab a towel to have a shower, thank you? Nothing says I love you like a clean pair of undies. And if they need clothes, we can get them clothes, particularly when it's cold. You can come here and get your CV written up for you. Uh, you can get your shoes polished, you can get a haircut, and you can get your washing done to help with drug rehabilitation and, and finding work, finding accommodation. It transforms lives, quite simply. Lots of firsts happened at the Wayside Chapel, and Wayside had a reputation for being light years ahead of the church. In 1964, the Reverend Ted Knoffs founded the Wayside Chapel in the heart of King's Cross as a drop-in centre with just one room. Welcome, everybody, to the Wayside Chapel. He was an old Methodist minister in those days and a bit of a radical. He was way before his time. Now authority is with the individual. It was full of bohemians and young people and poets and creative people, but it was also there prior to and just on the cusp of the drug culture. And I'm willing to take the risk. Now, if I take STP, and that's actually really dangerous. If I realise the dangerous, why not take it? Ted, he was probably the first person, really, to see it and take it seriously, that we were going to have a massive problem with recreational drug use. 
and people would overdose on the floor of his little chapel. And he just simply found out that nobody was geared up to help. So what came out of that was things like he had the first drug referral centre in the country. It started the first illegal injecting room that's now become a legal injecting room around the corner. And that actually transformed the cross in a really dramatic way. I never see a needle on the street here now. I don't see people collapsed in backs of lanes and whatever, and that's due solely to the safe injecting room here. Oh, I moved here when I was six years old and lived here for about 10 years. So I really did grow up on the streets of the cross, going to or hanging at the Wayside Chapel sometimes. Even as a child, it always felt like a very open, non-judgmental, warm place to be. Through this door here. When Graham took over Wayside, what, what he took over physically was a crumbling, derelict building. I did weddings in the little chapel, standing in an inch of water when it leaked. Uh, there was a light well, which is where most pigeons in Sydney went to die. <laughs> we had carpet and people had pissed in that and thrown up in that for 40 years before I got there. You could smell the wayside before you could see it. That's how in disrepair the building was. That you know, the roofs were falling in. It couldn't really deliver great services and it was condemned by work cover. So that was what he inherited when he joined as the pastor here, uh, a, a complete mess. My father was a gorgeous old minister and fire and brimstone underestimates the heat, really. <laughs> I never really thought I'd go into ministry. I couldn't quite live in black and white. Graham and I actually, we grew up together really and were married young. When we found that we weren't able to have our own children, then I thought the logical thing was to adopt children. We went into the hospital and, and the nurse said, would you like to pick up your son? Well, something happened in that moment that I probably will never explain. I picked him up and in one second, I became a different man. I, I wanted to be a man worthy of such a son. So you were an instant parent when we got James. And three and a half, four years later, we got Mandy, gorgeous little girl. Dad worked as predominantly a minister and a social worker in Pendle Hill during my youth. Happy, healthy household, you know, mum and dad, brother and sister, and a dog. <laughs> For 14 years, I was the minister at Pendle Hill Church of Christ, but also the director of their welfare arm for the denomination. Then uh, I bombed out in 1999. I had an affair that lasted a week, or two weeks or something. It wasn't very successful, <laughs> to say the least, but I'd done the wrong thing. And in due course, the church found out and threw me out as they should have, I'd done wrong. So I became a postie and I loved it actually. That was good for me. I was a shocking postie. Eventually it got to the board and was going to kill me, I think, and I got a phone call from Wayside Chapel. I think Wayside has been, still is, one of those remarkable places that says, doesn't matter how deep a hole you've fallen into, we can still find you and lead you out. There was a time where Dad really felt like he was going to be the minister that had to, sh to close the doors. It became fairly clear that if we didn't replace the building, we were going to go away, actually. Our first lucky break, like the biggest blooming thing and the turnaround at Wayside's history was when I met Ian Martin. I was shocked when I walked through the door. The organisation uh, really was in a dire financial position. And there'd been a fire. If you leaned against the wall, you got blank. 
It wasn't good. And remember that brick that fell off the roof? Where was that again? In the, in the side <laughs> lane there. He leaned over his shoulder and said, you don't need help, you need a revolution. And I said, you're right. I said, are you willing to help me? And he said, yeah. We're really looking for somebody who I think um, is going to be very hard to find because, <laughs> you know, we've just got such high expectations of what we want. Yeah. Ian Martin became our chair and that was the beginning of our turnaround. Without Ian, nothing that's happened would have happened. For a start, I just bought some really basic business disciplines. And, and yes, I had some connections with um, the big end of town. I'm, I'm happy to say that both Lucy and Malcolm have been very good friends to Wayside for a long time. Malcolm Turnbull came up to me and he said, how are you doing with your building campaign? I said it could be healthier. I actually had a balance of zero at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, put Lucy and me down for 250. I'm thinking, what, $200? Yeah. Anyway, clearly he meant quarter of a million dollars. I nearly fell over. So we raised eight and a half million dollars and the last two across the line were Dick Smith and David Gonski and then we had, we had it all. Woohoo, it started. Yes. <laughs> the new building opened in May 2012 and it was a moment of enormous joy. The community of King's Cross has a lot to celebrate. The Wayside Chapel brings together the richest and poorest in the neighbourhood and it's fought its way back from the brink of collapse. What stands behind me today on a little patch of earth in the cross is a magnificent building that better equips Wayside to help people in need. It's hoped this ceremony will mark the start of another 50 years of service for the Wayside Chapel. Once we had the new buildings, we were able to start more programs that we couldn't do before. There's a lot of activities and stuff, and the activities help you feel like a normal person again. They give you something to do with your time. All right, guys, we're going to be cooking chicken fajitas today. This is a recipe by Jenny Oliver. When I first came here, which was about 18 years ago, I uh, was homeless. Back then, I, it was really about my basic needs. Over the years, I've progressed doing a lot of the groups, cooking and computer classes, some of the creative groups like art and things like that. I guess through all of that, I've developed some really solid friendships. If I was him, I'd be excited slash... Terrified. Terrified. <laughs> I come to Wayside because it gives me a connection to people that I wouldn't have. It brings people good contact and good energy into my life. We have 800 active volunteers and we relate to the rich end of society as well as the bottom end. And it doesn't matter what floor you get out at, there's something going on in every room. No wonder why everything looking so good. Every Thursday we have garden classes. People can learn how to grow, how to uh, use the produce that they grow. It's beautiful. And then you can chop that up and put that in. It is one of the most extraordinary eco-friendly spaces in the city. We're going to put some fertiliser on it now. And that rooftop has become this place where it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, we all come together from our different walks of life and do something together and create that beautiful space. Oh my God, stop visiting, that is crazy. The people who come here, you couldn't even imagine the histories that some of those people have endured. And so I think Graham's own loss in um, his life has actually helped him in some way. We are. Got to come home at different times oh, yeah, tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm not home till. God knows. I'm home till later, so. James was my big brother and had a thirst and love for life. We joke he had two speeds full tilt, flat out, or stop. I loved fatherhood more than any bloke I've ever met. Every day as an adventure. And he became my best mate. We talked to each other every day. He eventually married and had children. 
who I just adored. I proclaim that you are husband and wife in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, for the first time in your life, you're going to kiss Mrs. Lowell, it won't be your mum. <laughs> he was diabetic. As he approached 30, there were plenty of issues with his diabetes. They'd only just arrived back from holidays in South Australia that day, and he'd had this massive cerebral hemorrhage. He was paralysed at one side. And I said to him, sweetheart, do you know Dad's here? And you know, do you know Sarah's here too? And he put his thumb up in the air. And I whispered in his ear that I'd look after his children. That was really the last communication. Oh, yeah, thanks, that's it. Well done. Yeah, there we go. Good shot. Well done. You can fall in a heap or you can just throw yourself into something. And thankfully, Dad had wayside. But I did go into autopilot. I did what I needed to do, but I wasn't very present. And one day I was running late for an appointment, which I hate, and I ran towards the front door of Wayside. And one of the shabbiest looking homeless people, this is really saying something, was blocking my way. And eventually he threw his arms around me and he gave me a kiss on the cheek and he whispered in my ear, that's from your son. Well, from that moment, I knew life and love was everywhere to be found and everywhere in need of me. And I came back to life. I think I've lived better since then. Life is just much more interesting. It's sad to see you go. Well, I'm hanging around for a little while. <laughs> Succession uh, was something that Graham and I have talked about over a very long period. There was nothing saying he needed to retire other than he felt it was time. I've had more farewell concerts than John Farnham. <laughs> I started looking at every clergyman I ever met as, could you do it? Would you be a fit? And the more I thought about it, the more John stood on his own. That one night when we first moved in, where there was a kid, the police were everywhere and there was a kid jumping all the back fences. And the I met him when his life ambition was to live amongst the poorest of the poor. And he wanted to find the roughest street in Sydney and to live there. And he wanted to run what was more or less a wayside out of his lounge room. You know, I, I just don't think most people growing up or living in Sydney or the inner suburbs of Sydney couldn't have a, a, a concept of what life can be like out here. No, it's a completely yeah. different world. It is, absolutely. We just put a call through and said, Graham, look, we're looking to set up in Sydney. Can you show us some of the neighbourhoods that have bad reputations? He drove me through a few neighbourhoods around Western Sydney and pretty soon we ended up in, in Mount Druid. How often would you go into someone's house and there's nothing in there, no furniture nothing. there? <laughs> you know, we also knew that just because some place's reputation is bad doesn't mean it doesn't have life and joy and potential in it. But we just wanted to get a feel for where was the sorts of places we could set up. Pretty soon we drove into Bidwell. I just had that moment where I knew this was the place. Good memories in this street, you know. I thought, well, you've got a great heart, but you are naive, baby. This is not going to last. John was born in Kuala Lumpur and he was six months old when we emigrated to Australia. 42, how did that happen? <laughs> Just I'll use the force. And we wanted to give them the best possible education and we felt Australia would be the right place. It's never a dull moment. Mm. Always, all through his life, May. Yeah. And don't stop now. <laughs> Grew up in suburban Melbourne in the late 70s, early 80s, with three sisters. Dad eventually set up a family law practice. We were the only coloured family in our whole neighbourhood. And he knows what it is to be on the outside, and he's been beat to a pulp by white kids because he didn't fit. There was a rebellious streak in him. He did his own thing, but uh, when we pulled him up, uh, he was a nice, obedient son. But he went out the next day and did what he wanted to anyway. 
I actually secretly wanted him to become a doctor. And, um, you know, a lawyer would have done fine, like Ziggs. Uh, he did well, and he went on to university to do a computer science and engineering degree. I had a bit of a crisis of conscience, a crisis, a life crisis at, at 22, <laughs> saying, what do I actually want to do with my life? I was working for a community organisation called Urban Neighbours of Hope, or you know, and John came to do a two-week course with us. People who are part of you know relocate into the communities where they're wanting to serve, trying to live at a similar level. So we take vows, including a vow of poverty. When I first heard about that, I thought, that's absolutely nuts. And the other thing was, that's absolutely amazing. He changed courses and did social work. He chose to work amongst asylum seekers and get paid next to nothing. Not only do you make me laugh, you make everyone here laugh. I think it's great. You bring joy into our lives every day, and it's wonderful. I was utterly devastated because I was still on a steep learning curve about life and what it meant. You can cry. <laughs> they felt I was rejecting them. They were just couldn't understand the path I was on. I could barely understand it. Yeah, even when there's serious stuff going on, you can still find the fun. John and I were married in 2001. This is <laughs> This says something about him. He went for a honeymoon with Mother Teresa in Calcutta. <laughs> well, you know. It, it seemed fitting to start our marriage in the way that we intended to live our lives. And then Kashama came along in 2003 and Kiri in 2004. So Lisa and I worked for 10 years in Springvale with Urban Neighbours of Hope and then we were invited to start a team up in Sydney. Unemployment in Bidwill is nearly four times higher than the national average. When we moved into the area, we thought, you know, this place needs a community centre and uh, it doesn't have one. So we thought, why wait for the government to do it? Let's just do it from our lounge room. <laughs> Once a week, Lisa holds cooking classes for local kids. Our mission was just to create community and to make our household as much as possible a safe place for kids, a safe place for women and a place of peace for men. You know, I think we had 13 people in a three-bedroom house at one stage. Did you guys dry your dishes as well as washing them? So it became the place to go to once you've been beat up by your husband and it's 2am. And it became the place to go for, for kids whose parents were drugged out or drunk or whatever. John was doing a hell of a lot for the kids and even the adults out there with uh, help, social workers going to court and general support and everybody in the community. And he's been doing it ever since I've known him. They lived as well as or as poorly as the rest of them. It was a shock to us because we were middle class. Here was our son eking out an existence, uh, the likes of which we've never experienced before. So it was hard to come to terms with. I never did quite understand why you didn't just really crack up. No, we didn't either, really. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we'd often... Uh, look at each other in bed some nights say, you still here? Is yeah. It? yeah, we're still here. Yeah. I honestly thought the cost would be too high. Their heart was just as passionate at the end of all of that than at the beginning. And I, I concluded somewhere along the track that this is a better bloke than me. And that's primarily why I thought this guy will fit. Graham said, just come on as assistant pastor and we'll see where it goes from there. And I remember the first day, I just remember just taking a moment just to stand in front of the chapel at the time before I headed upstairs. I didn't realise, though, uh, someone had seen me and had put a call through to the police saying that there's a new suspicious-looking drug dealer out the front. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my first interaction, <laughs> my first day officially as being part of the Wayside team. I'd like to think I'm peddling love. 
but that can sound dodgy also in King's Cross. <laughs> I said bluntly, this is your bloke right here. That's him. I found him. But, of course, they, you know, there was no way in the world they are going to make an appointment based on that. So they hired headhunters and headhunters combed the world. The inspirational leadership, the missional aspects, the ability to communicate. We joked about the fact that uh, we were clearly looking for somebody who was superhuman. from the burden of leadership <laughs> and welcome you into the role of Pastor Emeritus. God, who could possibly replace Graham? But I think the people here at Wayside, having seen John over the past however many months, have been, they're convinced that, yeah, they've found an equal in John. I declare that John Owens is commissioned as the pastor and CEO of Wayside Chapel. Dad took me aside and he just said, son, I'm proud of you. And that was a big moment, you know? That's, uh... That's a gift. What a, how lucky am I to hear that from my dad? We're not disappointed now, given way it has taken him and his passion. And we're very proud of him for what he's pursued over the past 20 odd years. I've since said to him, Dad, you can go and die now. I've heard everything I need to hear. <laughs> You know, Graham often calls me one in a million, which from my cultural background isn't a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> He's chosen someone who tells just as bad jokes as him, so I think that must have been the prerequisite for the role. <laughs> I'm Indian. We can't fight. <laughs> We're not even naughty. You know? <laughs> if we break into your house, we'd probably refigure your Wi-Fi to make it work properly. <laughs> My sister's first son. Mm. He was seven months when my sister died. Mm. The real compassion he shows for people generally is the key attribute that will make him a success in the role. The ambulance got there at one o'clock. She was pronounced dead at five past one. She died of a rush of appendix. Mm. When you give your life over, when you are out there to serve, it's not a one-way street. <laughs> my dad used to be an alcoholic. Yeah, fair enough. It's one of the greatest secrets that we discover at the Wayside Chapel is life flows in both directions. Love flows in all ways, shapes and forms. Are we getting food? Yes. Oh, awesome. <laughs> all over, thank you. Check it, that'd be good. Keep going, keep going. Thank God the public love Wayside and most of its funding is through private giving. But man alive, the weight on your shoulders. <laughs> I will not have to worry about trying to raise $10 million every year. Sorry? You haven't got much to do today. It's yeah, this, yeah, it's easy peasy. Yeah. I'll be free, really, to just yeah, yeah. do what I love. I've, I've got to go. I've okay. Been, so I'll support John in any way I can. <laughs> and I will be very much a pimple on the bum of Wayside. We all flourish best when we're necessary, significant, not central. I really believe that with all my heart. But now I have to demonstrate it. Ha, ha, ha.